Good morning. Uh, my name is Stretch Hoff, and uh, I'm an interviewer for Hamilton County uh, Library. Um, Dennis Daly is uh, doing our camera work today. And we have the honor of talking to Bill Petralia, and he's uh, here to tell us uh, his story from uh, birth to today. So <laughs> we can get started, and uh, uh, I'll just kind of act as a guide along when you just uh, tell your life story here. And I just like to start and let uh, people know where you were born, where you went to school, uh, and how you happened to get involved in the, uh, in the Navy. Navy. Mm -hmm. So. I'll be very yeah. happy to start in on that basis. Um, I am originally a native of New York City, born and bred, raised and educated there, came up through the parochial school system. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a freshman at Manhattan College School of Engineering in 1942. And mm -hmm. November of 1942, I enlisted in the Navy V-12 program, which was a officer candidate uh, training okay. program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was called to active duty uh, in July of 43, uh, sent down to Columbia University uh, to take on some uh, additional engineering courses. Uh, in the course of my uh, period of training at Columbia, I unfortunately contracted an illness uh, which had me miss a lot of my school classes. Mm -hmm. And rather than ship me out to Great Lakes Training Center, yeah. <laughs> uh, they offered me the opportunity to switch from an engineering candidate to deck mm -hmm. officer candidate, okay. which I accepted and I continued on in deck officer training uh, at uh, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And from there, I matriculated to Midshipman School at Cornell University. Well, you got in a lot of good schools. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what uh, originally, you, if you went uh, to Columbia for, uh, for engineering, more engineering courses, mm -hmm. what was your goal at that point? Well, I had intended to uh, follow through on civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And being 17 years of age and very adventurous at that time, and of course the war going full blast, yeah. uh, you know, I was seeking, you know, some action. And I thought uh, when they offered me this chance to become a deck officer, uh, that that would get me into some pretty fast action. Yeah. And what's the deck officer's duties? What is the deck officer? Well, a uh, deck officer um, maintains the uh, watch uh, underway, uh, responsible for keeping the ship on course, uh, mm -hmm. maintaining any incoming messages that get to the proper authorities. Mm -hmm. But as it turned out, um, I was commissioned out of uh, Cornell Midshipman School, uh, then went on and was selected for mine warfare training. And so I, mm -hmm. again, went to school at uh, Naval Mine Warfare School in Yorktown, Virginia. Okay. So uh, one might get the idea that the <laughs> Navy afforded me a great deal of training, which they did. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, upon, uh, say, what, about three months of training at mine warfare school, um, I then was sent to the West Coast for my first shipboard assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that first ship, believe it or not, was a converted tuna boat, tuna fishing boat. It was? Boat. Yeah, well, you probably thought all this education came out of tuna <laughs> boat. <laughs> Some of my thoughts yeah. ran along that line. Um, and uh, I went aboard there at Treasure Island. Is that in San Francisco Bay? Yes, yes. That's where my father. And from. I will tell you, uh, we swept out of uh, San Francisco Bay, and that was to me the roughest water that you'll encounter anywhere. Isn't Crossing right? the bar in San Francisco Bay I'll be darned. is, uh, you know, in a 98 foot fishing vessel yeah. converted to carry sweep gear mm -hmm. uh, was really an experience. I think Treasure Island was built. It's man-made just for uh, embarkation. Patient, yeah. right. Yeah. right. 
Well, I stayed there for uh, uh, two months, uh, daily going out on sweeps of the channel. And uh, then I was assigned to the vessel, which was uh, the one I spent the most time on in World War II. That was the YMS 413. Mm -hmm. It was a minecraft, 136 feet long, with about a 18 foot beam, an mm -hmm. eight and a half foot draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, would, I picked up the ship at uh, Bellingham, Washington. And mm -hmm. on my first duty with that ship was uh, in the Straits of Juan de Fuca, which is up in the borderline of Washington State. And uh, mm -hmm. believe it or not, uh, Again, I go back to the fact that I was seeking adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I found some in the assignment that the ship had. Uh, we were assigned as a harbor entrance control post vessel, mm -hmm. HECP. Uh, under the Straits of Juan de Fuca, there are strings of cables that uh, the Telephone? onshore okay. could uh, determine when a vessel was inbound or outbound. Okay. However, mm -hmm. they lacked the ability to identify, you know, the na nationality or, you know, what type of vessel it was. Mm -hmm. They only could determine that it was a ship inbound okay. or outbound. So we were moored to a mooring buoy there and, and darkness and fog would set in. We'd get a communication to get underway, proceed and identify. And mm -hmm. so we would proceed to swing uh, free from the mooring and head right for the ship in pitch black darkness oh, and fog. <laughs> and that was one of my earliest adventures of experiences. Right. Right. Uh, being a young ensign in charge of a ship underway, uh, I'm steering a collision course for this huge Russian freighter, which I didn't know. And you're know 17 at the time. years old. <laughs> well, I was Did you have your driver's license by <laughs> I think I had reached about 18 okay. and a half or so. But uh, uh, fortunately, the captain was also on the bridge with me. And as the, the procedure was that we would approach the vessel, turn on our uh, searchlights, and give him an AA, able, able, identify yourself. Mm -hmm. the, uh, ship then would respond with their name and where they were going. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the course of steering this collision course uh, to this vessel, I got too close and then made a, an emergency right turn. But when on shipboard, when you make a turn in the water, there is slippage. You yeah. just don't make a sharp right turn. And uh, fortunately, had I continued on that course, I would have thrown the stern of our ship right up against the bow of that freighter. Oh, and the captain, of course, was there. He countermanded my order yeah. <laughs> and uh, ordered an emergency back full, and we just backed off. And uh, As that freighter went by, you could just look up like that. Oh, <laughs> and oh my God. It was, you know, one of my more adventurous <laughs> experiences, yeah. I would say. Could you explain what, uh, what your, being a mine sweeping ship, what everything that you would do? Okay, when I first reported aboard, I was the mine sweeping officer responsible for uh, three different types of sweep gear. Uh, there are three types of mines that we deal with. A moored mine, mm -hmm. which consists, or a contact mine, it consists of an anchor, a cable to support the mine, and then the mine casing itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one type. Then there are magnetic mines, uh, which rest on the bottom. And uh, we use um, cable, uh, sweep gear that consists of streaming a huge long cable and a short cable out. And then we would pulse, an electric pulse, through the long cable and through the conductivity of the seawater, they get, complete the circuit mm -hmm. and create a magnetic field under the uh, cables. Mm -hmm. And this magnetic field, as it passed over, 
the magnetic mind would detonate the mind. Okay, so that's how you destroy So that's mind. a second yeah. type. Another type was the acoustic mind, which would uh, be activated by the propellers of a ship passing over. So mm -hmm. we had what was known as an acoustic hammer, where we would simulate the, simulate the sound of a ship passing over, and it would just beat a steady pulse mm -hmm. to detonate an acoustic mine. Well, mine warfare got pretty sophisticated, uh, I should mm -hmm. say yeah. thanks to the Germans in World War II. Uh, they managed to come up with uh, a counter uh, on, particularly on magnetic and acoustic mines, where one was passing over a magnetic mine, uh, this counter would count one on this counter. Mm -hmm. uh, the ships that were doing the sweeping would think, well, you know, there's no mine here. They would signal back and the convoy would leave port and this counter would click, click, click until it got to the preset number boom, the mines wow. would go off, and the convoy lost, oh, I don't know, they lost 100,000 tons in that English area wow. in World War II due to that one little item. Wow. They finally managed to get uh, a mine wash ashore, and they were able to discover mm -hmm. what was involved. But, uh, so the Germans had set those mines right outside San Francisco Bay? Oh, no, 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 no. This is, uh, I'm talking about what occurred in the other part of the world, oh, not that's, my experience. Oh, well, so, okay, okay. I, no, uh, I knew they were, they were afraid of German submarines being around <laughs> that area. Yes, <laughs> yes, very much so. No, let's get back to my <clears> ship. <throat> uh, after finishing several months of duty aboard uh, the YMS 413, we then received orders to proceed to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, so we sailed from Washington down the west coast to uh, San Pedro, where we formed up with a convoy. Uh, as some people may know, a YMS has a maximum speed of about 15 knots. Mm -hmm. That is almost flank speed for that yeah. ship. Uh, in this convoy, our mother ship was an LST, landing yeah. ship tank, uh -huh. and uh, we uh, went across the Pacific to Pearl Harbor at 10 knots. Wow. <laughs> Lengthy trip. The, Lengthy this is trip. in 1943? Is this, uh, this was in uh, 44, <coughs> 44, I guess. Okay. And uh, we arrived at, uh, no, let's let me take that back. It would be 45. Okay. Yeah, by the time I got <coughs> with all of my training, and uh, you know, when All I was in the Pacific, <laughs> yeah. I was uh, <laughs> well along, and it was 1945, the end mm -hmm. near the war's end. So, uh, from Pearl Harbor, we did routine patrol duty there for several months, and uh, the war ended. Uh, we were under the impression that we were to receive orders to return back to the states. However, uh, two hours before leaving, uh, we received a new set of orders uh, sending us to uh, the Marshall Islands oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. to participate in the first atomic bomb test mm. in Bikini. And this is where the, my experiences in the Pacific uh, took wow. hold. Uh, because of the characteristics of our ship, uh, we had uh, booms just aft of a midship, which helped us when we streamed mine gear. Well, these same booms uh, let down to the gunnels of the ship would enable us to stream trolling lines, fishing mm -hmm. trolling lines, uh, by way of an aside. There was a great deal of uh, anxiety on the part of the West Coast fishing industry at that time uh, when the Navy announced that they were going to conduct a nuclear test out in that wow. area. Uh, that area happens to be the spawning ground of the yellowfin tuna. Oh boy. Okay. And so uh, they placed a couple of uh, professional fishermen on board our ship. We rigged 
10 trolling lines on each boom. And for three to four months, we trolled because of our characteristics of the ship. We trolled right in close to the uh, atoll in shallow water. And we caught the most marvelous fish that yeah. you've ever seen. You kind of went a full cycle. You start out in a tuna boat. <laughs> <laughs> now you're catching a tuna. <laughs> you have something there. Starts. Yes, you do. And uh, we caught yellowfin tuna, 300-pound tuna, oh uh, wahoo, mahi-mahi, <clears throat> barracuda, shark. And the, the whole object of this fishing deal was to catch these fish, haul them on board. Uh, the professional fishermen then would uh, weigh them, cut them open, and examine them, and then pickle them in a barrel of formaldehyde. Uh, when we had a pretty full catch, we would transfer that catch to a refrigeration ship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. That became the control for the post bomb catch okay. so that we could determine whether or not there was any uh, significant radiation effect in the fish. So you had a benchmark bomb. there. And so we had a benchmark. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, yeah, that continued on uh, for about three months. Uh, we trolled between Bikini, Rangarik, and Rangalap, mm -hmm. and uh, morning till dusk, uh, you know, Wow. It's quite an experience. Now, did you uh, see the test going on? No. Uh, just... My points, believe it or not, were up two days before the test. <laughs> so uh, yours truly uh, caught a PBY uh, from Bikini back to Kwajalein. Mm -hmm. And from Kwajalein uh, flew a 320th Troop Carrier Squadron, caught a free ride. Uh -huh. back to Pearl, then back to Fairfield Susan uh, Air Force Base mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. And from there then back to New York where I was released okay. from active duty. Yeah. So those are some of my tales in regard to yeah. what happened in uh, World War II. The, um, the security must have been just really tight, I would think. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that test in Bikini. I have some information here. Uh, I was there for the first test, but uh, th there were about 15 other nuclear tests done at Bikini. 1,500? 15. 15, okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, for example, uh, the sunken ship sent to the bottom of the lagoon in 1946 uh, went down into a, what they call the Bravo's Crater. And uh, that, despite its paradoxical image of peace and earthly paradise, uh, quite a few ships were lost there uh, from that first uh, atmospheric bomb test. Uh -huh. uh, here are some of the ships that were in that atoll in preparation for the bomb test. Now, how, why, why were these ships lost? I mean, was it a result of the explosion? Yeah, yeah they wanted to see the and they, effect. And they were the, placed out there, were they? they? Was, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> ships that were going to be decommissioned, inactivated, and so mm -hmm. forth. And then the Navy felt that uh, they could afford to give them up. Uh, there was the USS Saratoga, an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. The USS Apagon, a submarine a battleship, the USS Arkansas, the USS Gilliam, a personnel carrier, a transport, the Lamson, a destroyer, a pilot fish, a submarine, and the Japanese battleship Nagato. Mm -hmm. All of these vessels were <clears throat> clustered in that lagoon oh. when that first bomb went off. Mm -hmm. And they all were just absolutely annihilated sunk to the bottom in this huge crater. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's been quite a few uh, people. Uh, Bikini was not a very large atoll. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, when the bomb went off, the atoll became uninhabitable. 
due to the radiation. Mm -hmm. And these people, uh, years later, wanted to return. And the scientists have determined that, uh, you know, while there isn't an excessive amount of radiation, anyone that went there and lived there over a period of time, uh, the levels would build up to uh, a dangerous level mm -hmm. within them. So they keep them apart. And the United States has paid $156 million uh, to the inhabitants of Bikini to compensate them for, you know, having taken over their island. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so. <clears throat> so do you happen to know the effect of all these beautiful tuna? What, what was the reason? Uh, to my knowledge, and I tried to maintain contact afterwards, uh, there was no appreciable uh, <clears throat> change in the fish as a result of that atmospheric test, yeah. right? Or else the West Coast fishing industry would be no more <coughs> if there yeah. was. Wow. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. Okay, so uh, after that, then you, you're back in New York. <coughs> right. Excuse me. And I uh, stayed in the organized reserve, uh, which was a godsend to me. Uh, first of all, <coughs> uh, I had to return to school to finish getting my degree. And so... Uh, what was that in, engineering? Engineering, mm -hmm. yes. I went back and uh, completed, uh, let's say it was about two and a half years more to get my degree. And I participated uh, in weekly drills in the organized reserve. It took the required active two weeks, active duty, mm -hmm. cruises to Bermuda, uh, Santiago, Tough Cuba, life. and so yeah. on. Uh -huh. and, uh, I yes, uh, married in uh, 1950, and one month after I was married, uh, lo and behold, I received my orders calling me back for uh, another stint in the oh. Korean episode. Oh, really? And okay. so there, another adventure began. <laughs> okay. Now, tell us, before we get into that, tell us a little bit, um, if I had to ask you about the size of the ship you were on, how many people were on it? Uh, uh, the YMS was a <coughs> very, very small ship, mm -hmm. 136 feet long, uh, a complement of uh, four officers and about 45 crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a draft of eight and a half feet, it bobbled all over the place, oh any yes. kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, storm or anything. As a matter of fact, we lost seven YMSs in the typhoon off uh, Okinawa in late in the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one blow, seven of those just YMSs capsized. were just absolutely wiped out. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, tell us about <coughs> Korea and... Uh, All right, well, here yes, another okay. adventure starts. <laughs> uh, we were called, I was uh, designated as the executive officer for the USS Pigeon, which had been a decommissioned vessel uh, in the reserve fleet down in Orange, Texas. And so, uh, with my new bride, and a car, which was a gift for my parents. Mm -hmm. We drove down to Orange, Texas and reported for duty. And uh, the ship was, of course, uh, recommissioned and underway for training, retraining, and fitting out. Uh, our initial assignment was home-based at Charleston, South Carolina, mm -hmm. the Charleston Naval Shipyard. And uh, from there, we operated uh, on the East Coast uh, with the trips to uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and uh, Panama City. Uh, then um, our uh, journeys took us to uh, operate in the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. Uh, we were part of the Sixth Fleet, um, operating, uh, I'll read here for a little excerpts of uh, what uh, took place here. The 
North Atlantic operations. Our pigeon departed Orange, Texas on January of 51 <coughs> to join Mine Squadron 8 in Charleston, South Carolina. Tactics and Atlantic fleet exercises took us to Norfolk, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. On 23 August of 52, we departed Charleston with Mine Division 82 uh, for the North, North Atlantic Treaty Organization Combined Fleet Exercises, uh, which was codenamed Operation Main Brace. We arrived at Rosslyn, uh, was that Rosseth, Scotland, and put to sea on the 19th to participate in Operation Main Brace, uh, which was uh, a sweep exercise off the coast of Denmark. Mm -hmm. And when we finished that sweep, uh, we returned down to uh, England, uh, Falmouth, and then proceeded into the Mediterranean and uh, became part of the Sixth Fleet. If you recall, during those years, uh, the Cold War was pretty well in effect, mm -hmm. and uh, one of our main objects was to show the American flag wherever we could in the European theater. And so our operations called on visits to Casablanca in North Africa, mm -hmm. uh, Sicily, Salerno, uh, Greece, uh, Piraeus, Greece, uh, Turkey. Uh, the mm -hmm. Turkey visit was uh, one that uh, deserves some comment. Uh, Turkey supposedly was our allies during this period of time, but somehow they did not <coughs> seem to fully trust us. Yeah. They main, uh, insisted that we transit the Dardanelles, which is the approach to Istanbul, in the dark so that we would not photograph their fortifications. Uh, oh, yeah. we <laughs> and that was an adventure yeah. in itself. Uh, of course, they gave us a pilot, which helped considerably. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we spent, uh, while we were there, uh, for those who recall geography, Istanbul is very, very close across the back sea to Russia. Yes. And so we were given strict orders that while we were in Istanbul, regardless of our port of call talk, talks and visits with dignitaries, uh, we had to maintain full alert status. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine our crew there uh, never chipped as much paint around our main armament as they did during that visit, you know, pretending to be chipping paint while in very close proximity to our uh -huh. main battery okay. with the uh, ammunition locker full open. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Uh, now, was the, what were the, in those days, in the, was the function of the sweep to go ahead of a, of a convoy uh, and, and look for the various A fleet minesweeper is a lot different than the YMS type vessel. Okay. It is a destroyer escort size vessel. It's 220 feet long uh, and it's equipped with all of the same type of minesweeping gear that I described for mm -hmm. acoustic, moored, and magnetic mines. Very interesting. Uh, but, uh, we also had, uh, you know, a much larger vessel capable of large speed. Uh, we had sonar for anti-submarine patrol. Okay. So we would operate as a screening vessel in operations with mm -hmm. the uh, main components of okay. the Sixth Fleet. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there was one operation there. Uh, uh, it was a joint exercise, and again, this was another adventure. <laughs> <laughs> How'd your wife like all these adventures you knew, Brian? <laughs> yeah. We operated uh, jointly with the British, the French, the Italian, and the Greek navies. And if you ever... How'd that work think, out? <laughs> uh, very, very roughly, <clears throat> we had an allied signal book, which, of course, was in English. Mm -hmm. And for these other foreign navies trying to interpret the wording of the signal, you know, and what flags to put up to yeah. signal uh, an operation. 
uh, a storm happened to come up while we were there, and the storm became so violent, the ships could not maintain the proper formations. So the order came out to break formation, uh, operate independently. And our ship went off on its way, uh, putting our bow into the waves so that, you know, you weren't going to get washed uh, mm -hmm. sideways. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, it turned out the next morning when dawn broke, there wasn't a single other vessel in sight. In that <laughs> convoy of large combat vessels and screening vessels. Everybody had so dispersed, it took us until the next afternoon before <laughs> we all rejoined. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, so yeah, that, that was an adventure. So tell me about the Korean part of this now. Did you get over in those? Uh, no, uh, we acted uh, as a training vessel uh, where we trained uh, individuals uh, mm -hmm. that would go over to Korea. Okay. So I did not see service in Korea, mm -hmm. although I was, you know, on active duty in that particular period. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, you sure saw a lot of the world, uh, uh, at least yes, from the, yes, from the, the shoreline. Pacific Atlantic, <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> very, very much so. But, you know, I will say one thing. Uh, I never regretted being called back to service. Mm -hmm. The Navy taught me so many, many things leadership, discipline, you know, skills that yeah. I would not have normally come upon, you know, as a young lad right. growing up uh, in a, you know, scholastic so at, world. So at that time, you would be about uh, 25 yes, years old? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that experience also led to my uh, engineering career, uh, I was um, back in Charleston uh, getting ready to be released and uh, someone told me that, uh, hey, my company is looking for engineers, why don't you send them a resume? And I said, well, what's the company? And he said, uh, Procter & Gamble. He said, I was wondering who, how you got here. Who was, who, who <laughs> yeah. was pre and G? <laughs> yeah. But I soon found out. Uh -huh. uh, they gave me the interview, and I went back home. And you know, they asked me while I was being interviewed, "You wouldn't mind taking a little test for us?" Uh -huh. And I said, "No, not at all." And I had been away from engineering for two and a half years. So when I went home uh, to Charleston, I told the wife, "Well, I don't think we'll hear anything back." But uh, they did. They made me an offer. Great. I accepted. And, returned here to start a 34-year career with Procter & Gamble. Good for Gamble. you. You had a fantastic resume. I mean, well, that was, uh, as I say, the Lord's been good to me in my life, yeah. uh, kept me safe and sound, and from that 17-year-old adventurous kid that wanted action, <laughs> <laughs> I may not have got all the action I thought I wanted, but yeah. I, I had So, enough. when you, uh, when were you then uh, out of service? Was that, were you in there for a year uh, yes. or two? Yes, the... I, I was uh, at that time a senior lieutenant and I was up for <laughs> lieutenant commander. And uh, you know, I had the family, I had uh, two children then. And uh, I decided, well, you know, twice around I think is enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And starting my career with Proctor, I you know, said, no, I don't think I'll take the next promotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so shortly after that, I received my uh, retired designation from the Navy. Okay, and so you came to, with Proctor in town here in the 1952, three uh, 53 area? 53 I started. <coughs> okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 34 years with Proctor here. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Retired in 87. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. made Cincinnati my home. Of course, in the early years with Proctor, uh, I was in the construction department. And that involved a lot of moving around. Uh, I m managed construction for the company in Port Ivory, Staten Island, um, then out in Iowa City where we built a new toilet goods plant, mm -hmm. and then down to Kansas City, uh, one of our fatty alcohol uh, facilities, mm -hmm. then back to Port Ivory, 
uh, where we built the Comet facility, and then back to Cincinnati. <laughs> wow. So we moved around quite a bit. Uh -huh. And I remained in engineering until, uh, I guess, within about six years of my retirement. Uh, the engineering division then uh, was in the process of outsourcing, uh, reducing the numbers. And uh, they offered me an opportunity. They said, well, Bill, we know you and uh, we know what you're capable of. Uh, how would you like a change of assignment? And I said, no, why not? So maybe some of that adventure is still stuck yeah, with still me. Still there. <laughs> so from an engineering and construction career, I came down to the world of advertising, packaged soap and detergent advertising. advertising. Right. Wow. And I wound up uh, an office manager in uh, that area, uh -huh. uh, responsible for uh, tra more training um, and administrative details down there. That was a complete switch for you. That was yeah. That's kind of invigorating, though. Oh yes, yeah, I, yes. That yeah. Me, uh, yeah. Keeps you active, that's uh -huh. for sure. Okay. And it was very, very interesting. Uh, as another aside here, to watch all these young folks. You know, I knew my career and yeah. I knew where my limits were. That I had reached my zenith. Uh -huh. But to watch these young tigers come in, you know, grasping <laughs> up that corporate ladder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. You know, somewhat amusing for me to see all of the, uh, you know, strategies in yeah. play there. Mm -hmm. They work long, hard hours, that's for sure. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. That was almost a requisite. Yeah. You know, you're not here for eight hours a day. Right, right. Well, tell me then about your family. Uh, well, the Lord blessed us with uh, three wonderful children, uh, two boys and a girl. Um, my eldest son, uh, well, he would have been 59 in uh, September. He just passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lost him. But uh, my daughter is uh, very, very active in Boston area. Mm -hmm. uh, she's married to an executive up there. Has been past president of Sony and Reebok and oh, Palm and all those things. So they mm -hmm. have a large estate up there in Boston. And my other son is another aside for you. He, I guess, thought he wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps and be an engineer. So he selected electrical engineering out of Villanova. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was there at Villanova at the time Raleigh Massimino took the Wildcats uh -huh. to their championship. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he was the sportscaster for that period. On graduation, he came home and announced to Dad, Dad, I don't want to be an engineer. I want to be in sports. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting yeah. times in Villanova. So that's where he is today. He's a uh -huh. sportscaster up there in Boston. Uh -huh. uh, does independent work for ESPN and WEEI up there in Boston. Oh, great. So yeah. I'm very proud of him. Uh, my daughter is on the board at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh -huh. in Boston. Uh, she uh, also uh, fancies hunting dogs. Uh, she's raised uh, about three championship uh, Sussex Spaniel dogs and uh, very happy up there. How about grandchildren? Uh, my son and married and uh, they adopted two Chinese children. Did they really? And again, very, very blessed. The children now, uh, Janie is uh, 10. Emma is about uh, seven, uh -huh. and just the brightest youngsters you'd ever Wonderful. want to meet. Wonderful, yeah, that's great. So, as I said, that's an involved process. I mean, you have to go over there. Oh, and, yes, uh, yes, we, uh, yes. We had a girl that uh, worked with me, and uh, she, did, she had adopted one. And boy, the process is amazing. Mm -hmm. But that's wonderful. Yeah, they went over uh, with a group from that Boston mm -hmm. area. And uh, I guess then they split when they were over there going to different provinces mm -hmm. to pick up their designated uh, adoptees. Amazing. Well, do you ever have uh, reunions with uh, uh I now belong Navy to buddies? the uh, Naval Mine <coughs> Warfare Association. This pin I wear is mm -hmm. our logo pin. Oh, I see it right here. Too. Yes, okay. yes. And then it's a magazine that uh, keeps us pretty well informed on what's happening in the world. 
It's called the Silent Defenders, and it gives good write-ups and histories mm -hmm. of uh, experiences of folks that uh, went through an awful lot of uh, operations in the Pacific mm -hmm. as well as, uh, you know, in the Atlantic convoy duty. Well, it sounds like you were pretty safe from uh, airplanes attacking your ships, or weren't you? Uh, Did you ever? No, uh, I can't speak, you know, for my ship, but for other ships, uh, late in the war, those uh, su uh, suicide kamikazes were deathly. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, they wreaked havoc on <clears> us <throat> because, you know, they didn't care. Their purpose was to crash their aircraft right into yeah. a ship. So, uh, when you're when they were sweeping mines inshore, you, you have to sweep close to shallow water for, mm -hmm. for mines. And uh, you're, you're in unprotected, uh, you have this tremendous sweep gear astern, which uh, involves or uh, limits your maneuvering. Mm -hmm. And so these kamikazes, uh, you know, found a pick fixed target almost and would just dive right down. Yeah, we lost many, many hmm. uh, ships, both minecraft and destroyers, and uh, to do the kamikazes mm -hmm. late in the war. Okay. Yes. So what do you do in retirement? Well, <laughs> many things. Uh, one of the things I did learn to do is how to run a computer. <laughs> Good for you. A lot of so, people don't want to tackle that. Uh, I have uh, my son-in-law, one of you, of course, is a technological genius. He's a MIT graduate. Yeah. And, uh, I use my 15-year-old grandson for that. <laughs> <laughs> he fixed me up very recently with a new double screen uh, computer setup, and I'm into that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of Googling, looking up things, yeah. or get a lot of email from friends, keep up with that. There's probably a lot of, of history on your on your service there. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh, it's, that's where I got a lot of yeah, this Yes, amazing stuff, to me. You can uh, Google these different uh, mm -hmm. things, and boy, it's all there. Yes, yes. So the other part of me uh, involves uh, trying to keep as physically fit as I can. Uh, I try to exercise five days a week for an hour or so. Good for you. And then you. we have our I would do that. coffee clutch with the guys. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, after exercise, it's to Mickey D's for some coffee uh -huh. and conversation and how the world is going to something in a pot. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine that, yeah, yeah. Well, good for you health-wise, that's, that's terrific. Yeah, I wish uh, things could be a little better with my back, but uh, I'm not complaining, yeah. believe me. Yeah. When I see some of these lads coming back from this Afghan and Iraq situation, yeah. I, I just am so upset about that. that we're involved in something that, uh, you know, it, it's not the normal kind of warfare that you think right. about, you know, with these IEDs and so forth. Terrifically different, and uh, but you know they uh, they have pride in serving. That's for sure. Uh, very very true. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I can see myself at 17, and I look, listen to some of these lads about why did you join? You know yeah. I say well that was me quite a few years yeah. ago. <laughs> <laughs> well good for you. Um, okay that's. I learned some things here. That's very interesting. I liked your yeah. conversation about the types of uh, mines there. And oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the, again, the Navy gave me a tremendous education. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what these mines consist of. And, uh, for example, let's talk about the magnetic mines for a moment. A lot of uh, people think that in order for a ship to uh, cause a magnetic explosion, that the ma mine would come up and hit the hull of the ship, you know, attracted by magnetism. Mm -hmm. But it's not so. Uh, these mines are uh, set in a condition running from the north to the south pole on magnetic lines of force, okay? Really? <laughs> and when a ship goes through and cuts these magnetic lines of force, they create a change. And in the magnetic mine, you have what they call this dip needle set for that particular location. 
as the ship goes through and changes uh, that magnetic force in yeah. that area, the dip needle dips, completes the circuit, and the mine explodes. Now, who thought that? Who oh, figured I'm that out? <laughs> I don't know who <laughs> claimed ownership for that. But, uh, That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, any other adventures you want to wrap up here with? Well, I think I've given you as much of a summary of my, my naval force here. Um, uh, I did participate in the honors flight, and I must say I did was you? tremendously honored. Uh, the honor flight of the tri-state area. I did that. Uh, sent us all. Did you take I was, that? I was a guardian. Oh, were you? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, I had a guardian myself. <clears throat> yeah. and. Uh, we left Blue Ash, bussed up to Columbus, and from Columbus flew southwest into Baltimore. And as we deplaned in Baltimore to get the bus to drive down to Washington, there was this tremendous array of people and military and Navy personnel. That really gets And they gave uh, outstanding applause. I'm telling you, it was absolutely awesome. Yeah. It, it all brought tears to my eyes. Me too. I, mean, I was really, uh, we went out of Dayton. <clears throat> this was last year. And, uh, you know, your generation don't consider yourself heroes. You know, it's just your job. Yeah. But, like, but there were people in the restaurants got up and clapped, and, and uh, everybody done that whole mm -hmm. congress. That was yeah. just. To me, that was the highlight of the whole trip, and mm -hmm. it just started. You know? Well, it, it, it was a, a highlight, i got to say that. Yeah. And the organization that they went through, they had every single detail planned out. Yeah. As turned out, it was 100 degrees when we took our flight into Washington oh, that my day. Goodness. And so they had cases of bottled water there yeah. for us, insisting that we have this bottle every oh, time yeah. we yeah. stop. You know, drink water, drink water. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing that was very impressive to me when uh, I had the greatest time because my uh, the, my uh, veteran uh, had an artificial leg, and he was from Western Hills, and his friend from elementary school was with him, and he was also a veteran, mm -hmm. and these two guys were the most fun, and I was wheeling him all over, you know, <laughs> and uh, but they were a lot of fun. Great. But the thing that really impressed me was also. Um, touring the memorial itself, all ages of people came up and thanked them. I mean, kids that, you know, hardly knew what World War II <laughs> was and, you know, had very little knowledge of it, clear up to, uh, you know, other veterans that were there. So it was very impressive. It was just wonderful. Yeah, God bless them for establishing that. I mean, because there are many, many people that would not have had a chance to yeah. visit those memorials. They, and uh, I'm sure you recall, you know, we, World War II memorial is impressive as all get oh, out yeah, and Very so. impressive. And then we covered the Vietnam and, uh, yeah. yeah. The, um, they have, uh, this started in Dayton, Ohio. Do you know this, the story of this? No, one? no, I did not. And there was this dentist, I think, and he had a patient in his chair, and he, and he happened to mention that the memorial was opening this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you going to go? And he said, oh, no. He said, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to go there. I'll never get there. Well, this guy had a plane, an airplane, and just a small plane. He says, well, you want to go? I'll take you. And so he took, and he grabbed another buddy, I think, and so he took two vets over there. <clears throat> and, of course, it came back, and the word spread. And then the dentist had... Uh, I think three other friends that had airplanes, so they took some more people, and it's evolved now to where they have, uh, I think, over 25,000 people nationwide have been there in this program. And there was, uh, as you know, they come and go the same day. Yes, yes, oh, it was know, a well, long day. <laughs> even uh, the most dramatic story I ever heard was, um, I think it was in Colorado, they had about, um, 1,500 veterans signed up to go to this, you know, mm. and uh, some guy with a lot of money uh, leased three 747s, and he took them all to Washington, wow. and all the way back in one day, because, you know, they, they don't stay overnight, right. logistics yes. and so yes. forth, be, be, but that's, uh, that's the dedication a lot of these people have. Mm. So it's a, 
And I wanted to do it again this year, but I go clear to the end of the list, see? And there were 100. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, and there were 150. I kind of talked my Guardians. way in the first one. There's 150 veterans. There are uh, gui guidance, uh, your guardian volunteers ahead of me now that mm -hmm. I'm at the end of the list. And uh, some of the guardians are like the daughters and sons of the veterans. So mm -hmm. they get the right, right. first choice. So. That's a wonderful program. I'm glad you did that. Was it this yeah. year you did it? Yes, okay. uh, June 23rd, I think was. Good for you. Like that. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you um, very much. This has been stretch. very thank entertaining. You Thanks for, for your service. Good. I love that handshake. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks for your service. We all appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you.